Hello friends, welcome to our audiobook. Today we are going to learn about gravitation which is science and technology part 1 chapter 1 gravitation. Let's have a quick glimpse of what are we going to learn in gravitation. We are going to learn about definition of gravitation, what is Kepler's law, acceleration due to gravitational force of the earth, free fall, circular motion and centripetal force, Newton's universal law of gravitation and escape velocity. Now, can you recall what are the effects of a force acting on an object? Or can you recall what types of force are you familiar with? And what do you know about the gravitational force? Now, we have seen in the previous standards that gravitational force is a universal force and it acts not only between two objects on the earth but also between any two objects in the universe, right? Now, let us learn about how this force was discovered. As we have learned, the phenomenon of gravitation was discovered by Sir Isaac Newton. The story goes like he discovered the force by seeing an apple falling from the tree on the ground. He wondered why all the apples fall vertically downward and not an angle to vertically upward. Now why do they not fly off in a horizontal direction or, or to the another direction? After much thought, he came to the conclusion that the earth must be attracting the apple towards itself and this attractive force must be directed towards the center of the earth. The direction from the apple on the tree to the center of the earth is the vertical direction at the position of the apple and thus the apple falls vertically downwards. An apple tree on the earth, the force on an apple on the tree is towards the center of the earth, that is, along perpendicular from the position of the apple to the surface of the earth. The figure also shows the gravitational force between the earth and the moon. Right, the distance in the figure are not according to the scale. Okay, so Newton thought that if the force of gravitation acts on apple on the tree at different heights from the surface of the earth. Right, so can it also act on objects at even greater heights? Much farther away from the earth, like for example the moon, can it act on even further objects like other planets and the sun? So these were all the thoughts he had when he saw the apple falling on the ground. Let us learn what is force and motion. We have seen that a force is necessary to change the speed as well as the direction of the motion of an object, right? Can you recall what are Newton's law of motion? Just think of it. Introduction to scientist. A great scientist who discovered the gravitational force, Sir Isaac Newton. He was one of the greatest scientists of recent times. He was born in England. He gave his laws of motion, equations of motion and theory of gravity in his book Principia. Before this book was written, Kepler had given three laws describing planetary motions. However, the reason why planets move in the way described by Kepler's law was not known. So, Newton with this theory of gravity mathematically derived Kepler's law. In addition to this, Newton did groundbreaking work in several areas including light, heat, sound and mathematics. He invented a new branch of mathematics, this is called calculus and has wide-ranging application in physics and mathematics. He was the first scientist to construct a reflecting telescope. Isn't that great? So this was all about the Sir Isaac Newton. Now what is circular motion and centripetal force? Now we'll have one activity. We are going to try this. You just need to tie a stone to one ending of a string. Take the other end in your hand and rotate the string so that the stone moves along a circle which is as shown in the figure 1.2a. Are you applying any force on the stone? Just try this and you will come to know what are we going to learn further. So just try this activity and we will come along. Think of it that in which direction is this force acting? How will you stop this force from acting? And what will be the effect on the stone? Now as long as we are holding the string, we are pulling the stone towards us that is towards the center of the circle because we are standing in the circle, right? And are applying a force towards it, right? The force stops acting if we release the string, correct? In this case, the stone will fly off along a straight line which is the tangent to the circle at the position of the stone when the string is released because 
that is the direction of its velocity at that instant of time. Just have a look on figure 1.2b. You may also recall that we have performed a similar activity previously in which a 5 rupee coin kept on a rotating circular disc flies off the disc along the tangent to the disc. Thus, a force acts on any object moving along a circle and it is directed towards the center of the circle. Now, this is what we call as the centripetal force. Centripetal means center seeking that is the object tries to go towards the center of the circle because of this force. Now, can you relate the relation between why I told you to do this activity? Because just to make you understand the centripetal force. Now, you know that the moon, which is the natural st satellite of the earth, goes round it in a definite orbit. The direction of a motion of the moon as well as its speed constantly changes during this motion. So, do you think some force is constantly acting on the moon? Now, what must be the direction of this force? How would its motion have been if no such force acted on, acted on it? Do the other planets in the solar system revolve around the sun in a similar fashion? Yes, so is similar force acting on them? What must be its direction? From this activity which you performed right now is the example and questions. It, it is clear that for the moon to go around the earth, there must be a force which is exerted on the moon and this force must be exerted by the earth which attracts the moon towards itself. Similarly, the sun must be attracting the planets, right? So including earth towards itself, right? So are you getting the relationship? Just think on it. Now what is Kepler's law? Let's understand the Kepler's law. Planetary motion had been observed by astronomers since ancient times. Before Galileo, all observations of the planet's positions were made with naked eyes. By the 16th century, a lot of data were available about planetary positions and motion. These are known as Kepler's laws, which are given below. Now, before knowing the laws, we will first know that do you know about an ellipse an ellipse is the curve obtained when a cone is cut by an inclined plane. It has two focal points. The sum of the distances to the two focal points from every point of the curve is constant f1 and f2 are two focal points of the ellipse. And it is also shown in figure 1.3. You can have a look. And if a and b and c are three points on the ellipse, then af1 plus AF2 equals to BF1 plus BF2 equals to CF1 plus CF2. Now let's come to the Kepler's law. What are the Kepler's laws? Now Kepler's first law was the orbit of a planet is an ellipse with the sun at one of the foci. Just have a look on figure 1.4 which shows the elliptical orbit of a planet revolving around the sun. The position of the sun is indicated by S. What is the Kepler's second law? The line joining the planet and the sun sweeps equal areas in equal intervals of time. Just have a look on the figure. A, B and C, D are distances covered by the planet in equal time. That is, after equal intervals of time, the positions of the planet starting from A and C are shown by B and D respectively. The straight lines A, S and C, S sweep equal area in equal interval of time that is area asb and cst are equal correct what the third law says the square of its period of revolution around the sun is directly proportional to the cube of the mean distance of a planet from the sun thus if r is the average distance of the planet from the sun and t is its period of revolution then we will get the one derivation now, Kepler obtained this laws simply from the study of the positions of planet obtained by regular observations. He had no explanation as to why planets obey these laws. We will see below how these laws help Newton in the formulation of this theory of gravitation. Now, let's go to the Newton's universal law of gravitation. 
All the above considerations, including Kepler's law, led Newton to formulate his theory of universal gravity. According to this theory, every object in the universe attracts every other object with a definite force. Correct. This force is directly proportional to the product of the masses of the two objects and is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Now, here is a little introduction about Kepler. Johannes Kepler was a German astronomer and mathematician. He started working as a helper to the famous astronomer Tycho Brahe in, Pra in 1600. After the sudden death of Brahe in 1601, Kepler was appointed as the royal mathematician in his place. Kepler's, Kepler used the observation of planetary position made by Bray to discover the law of planetary motion. He wrote several books. His work was later used by Newton in postulating his law of gravitation. Now in figure 1.5 shows two objects with masses m1 and m2 kept at a distance from each other. Mathematically, the gravitational force of attraction between, between these two bodies can be written as Here, G is the constant of proportionality and is, equal, and is called universal gravitational constant. The above law means that if the mass of one object is doubled, the force between the two objects also doubles. Also, if the distance is doubled, the force decreases by a factor of 4. If the two bodies are spherical, the direction of the force is always along the line joining the center of the two bodies. And the distance between the center is taken to be d. In case when the bodies are not spherical or have a regular shape, then the direction of force is along the line joining their center of mass and d is taken to be the distance between the two center of mass. Now from equation 2, it can be seen that the value of g is the gravitational force acting between two unit mass kept at a unit distance away from each other. Thus, in SI units, the value of g is equal to the gravitational force between two masses of 1 kg kept 1 meter apart. The center of mass of an object is the point inside or outside the object at which the total mass of the object can be assumed to be concentrated. The center of a mass of a spherical object having uniform density is at its geometrical center. The center of mass of any object having uniform density is at its centroid. Now why did Newton assume inverse square dependence on distance in his law of gravitation? He was helped by Kepler's third law in this which is shown here. Uniform circulation motion or magnitude of centripetal force. Consider an object moving in a circle with constant speed. We have seen this earlier that such a motion is possible when the object is constantly acted upon a force directed towards the center of the circle, right? And this force is called a centripetal force and you have done the activity on it too, right? So if m is the mass of the object, v is the speed and r is the radius of the circle. M is the mass of object, V is the speed and R is the radius of the circle. Remember it. And then it can be shown that the force is equal to M V square upon R. If a planet is revolving around the sun in a circular orbit in uniform circular motion, then the centripetal force acting on the planet towards the sun must be F equals to mv square upon r. Whereas m is the mass of planet, v is the speed and r is the distance from the sun. Now what is the formula of speed? Speed equals to distance travelled upon time taken. The speed of the planet can be expressed in the term of period of revolution t 
the distance travelled by the planet in one revolution equals to parameter of the orbit is 2 pi r. r is distance of the planet from the sun. Time taken equals to period of revolution equals to t. Thus, Newton concluded that the centripetal force, which is the force acting on the planet and is responsible for its circular motion, must be inversely proportional to the force of gravity and hence postulated the inverse square law of gravitation. The gravitational force is much weaker than the forces, other forces in nature, but it controls the universe and decides its future. This is possible because of the huge masses of planets, stars and other constituents of the universe.